I never just spoke for a while. Oh. Is that problematic? <laughs> testing, testing. <laughs> testing, one, two. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Hannah. This is Ivy. Hi. Um, we're just going to be doing a very cursory talk on amateur radio licensing in Australia. Um, this isn't directly related to SDR, but I mean, there's certainly a crossover between radio technology and you know circuitry and the SDR community and tinkering and whatnot. Um, just to get started, um, there are three levels of licensing that you can achieve. Actually, should we just cover what amateur radio is? Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Amateur radio is, well, I find it a lot of fun because, one, you can talk to weird and interesting people halfway across the world, and if you get bored of them, just turn off the radio and walk away because you can pretend it was propagation mucking up. Um, I have done that. I honestly have. But I, I've spoken to, I, I have spoken to an astronaut. I've spoken to somebody involved in the um, Apollo program. Uh, the best call, though, was actually just speaking to some random guy in the north of Sweden from 60 kilometres southeast of Melbourne yeah. on a nice summer's day. So that's half the fun, but there's a lot more. Yeah, so I mean, originally um, when radio was coming to be, um, there was obviously lots of radio engineers that were tinkering and wanting to get on the air. And um, pre um, any regulation or licensing, um, people were building their own radios and just you know, transmitting whatever they wanted. Um, but the ITU, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, um, amongst the UN later on, um, actually set out uh, differencing licensing levels for actual amateur radio use and um, allowed you know, the world to achieve licenses in order to legally transmit um, on a huge range of frequencies. Um, originally it was kind of like open slather, but now there are frequency bands that are set aside for amateur radio use. Um, as I said, the ITU uh, is amongst the UN. The ACMA is our local um, regulatory body. The Wireless Institute of Australia is kind of just the peak body for amateur radio operators. And they are the ones that are actually responsible for organizing the licensing. Um, there is a fee, you get a call sign. Um, it's not too expensive, it's a bit slow because there's only actually two people in the ACMA that operate the entire amateur radio licensing in the country. Um, so the first level of license is foundation. Um, you're limited to 10 watts of um, what's called peak envelope, um, which is the amount of energy that the radio itself actually puts out at the antenna port. Um, you can build your own antennas, which is my favorite part of the hobby. Um, and you can actually increase the overall transmit power based on the antenna design that you use. Um, but 10 watts is the uh, maximum that the radio itself can put out. Um, because it's the foundation license, it's the easiest to get, obviously, um, but you're limited to um, the shortest range of frequencies up from 80 meters all the way up to 70 centimeters which is actually quite a lot of spectrum that you're allowed to use. Um, unfortunately, because it's the most basic, you're not allowed to tinker, so you have to use commercially built equipment, and you're not allowed to transmit digital modes. So it's basically only voice. The exam is pretty easy. It's just 25 questions and a practical exam. The practical is very easy. Basically, it means you can connect up a radio to mains power and an antenna without killing yourself. That's that's pretty much, and I have seen people fail it. <laughs> don't, don't, it is an easy exam, but people have failed. The the, the multiple choice exam, it's, look, it's easy. It's a bit of regulation, a bit of theory, and a bit of safety. That's mostly pretty much, it's, as Hannah says, it is mostly safety. The idea is to get you on the air without killing yourself, because the amount of, um, at least once a year, there is an amateur radio operator somewhere around the world who will kill themselves by 
flicking up an antenna into high voltage power lines. You think that's common sense to look up, <laughs> seriously. Um, but the, the test is super easy. I mean, you can sit down with the assessment um, guidebook in an afternoon and learn everything there is to know to pass the foundation assessment. Um, once you um, are comfortable and you've um, passed the hands-on, um, you can go straight to the standard license, um, or you can stick with the foundation license, um, and you're obviously limited to the previous restrictions that we showed. The next level up is the standard license, which extends into the VHF, um, UHF section, all the way up to 5.8 gigahertz. So this does actually mean that you can operate in 2.4 and 5.8 ISM bands using 100 watts of peak and flow of power, which you wouldn't <laughs> want to do. Um, a microwave oven, for example, uses like 2.2 or so. If you were to stand next to a 100 watt 2.4 gig transmitter, uh, you'd get warm. <laughs> yeah, you'd get warm. Um, however, this license does let you start playing with digital modes, and you're allowed to modify and build your own equipment. And the digital modes are a lot of fun, obviously. Um, there's quite a few um, modulation schemes that are developed specifically by amateur radio operators. Um, one that's quite common these days is PSK31, which um, is just a very, very narrow bandwidth phase shift key um, modulation that a um, Sound Blaster 16 can operate at um, quite efficiently. And because the, the amount of bandwidth that it uses is so, so small, the efficiency is through the roof. So, um, so on 80 meters or 20 meter amateur radio bands, a 100 watt transmitter with PSK31 can easily go around the world. You can talk to people all over the place. I used to have an, like, an afternoon conversation um, with a guy I met in Fiji. Just every day it was continuous. Um, the, just you know, the most basic amount of power. Now, with the standard licensing, there's two parts to the exam. The hardest part is the regulations exam, because that means you're, you're having to do an exam on the Radio Communications Act 1992 and the license control definitions of the LCD. It's difficult, but if you just put your mind to it, it is fairly easy to pass. The theory exam is a 50 question exam. Again, it's theory, a bit of electronics theory, a bit of mathematics. You need to know how to transpose your um, different um, units. units. Sorry, the, the, SI prefixes. the SI prefixes, which I often got wrong. Seriously, I would, I would muck those up. And like some electronic theory, such as Ohm's Law, but being able to work at it from both ways. But in the end, it is just a multiple choice test. And if um, you ever studied in school, you know that it's not too difficult to sit down and learn 50 questions quite easily. Um, the highest level is advanced, which basically opens up the doors. Um, below 136 kilohertz and above 256 gigahertz, there actually is no local regulation. So it's a bit um, out in the open, I guess you could say. Like um, You can start playing with lasers with no restrictions, really, um, unless you start putting them at airplanes or something like that. Um, but basically allows you to access the amateur radio bands all the way across the radio spectrum. Um, ridiculous amounts of power, you can always apply um, to the ACMA if you want to transmit 6,000 watts and point it at the moon and see if you can bounce a signal off the moon. People do that all the time. You just have to write a letter to the ACMA. Um, and the other advantage of the advanced license is you can actually start making automated systems. So there are certain groups of people that set up beacons to automatically communicate to each other around the world using um, high frequency bands. Um, and they you know, talk to each other autonomously um, without operator interaction. Um, this is the highest level test, so it's going into all the theory that you need. You actually basically have to be able to design uh, LC circuits and um, you know a bandpass filter for audio or radio frequencies. Um, you have to know uh, much more of the electronics theory. And um, it, this exam is difficult. Again, it is a multiple question test, but they really do throw odd answers. Um, 
there's there's things in there that look right that are definitely wrong. And um, I did have I do have to say, the first time I did it, I failed it. Went back then uh, two days later and then passed it. Again, if if you say you you feel like you're confident enough to go straight to the advanced exam without doing the foundation or the standard, you still have to do that very very beginning practical exam and the regulations exam and this one to get your advanced license. Um, that's all of the slides. Um, I quickly prices the WA chart, WIA charges for the assessors um, to give the test. If there is enough interest amongst the group, um, I'd be happy to organize for a group of assessors because you need two to actually perform the test um, to set a time aside to assess and administer the test at various levels. Um, so if you're interested in possibly sitting for any level of the exams, uh, just let me know. Uh, my email address is there, and I it's, it's up there as well. And um, the first two URLs linked are just um, information about amateur radio and you know, obviously the regulations. Res.net.au is a WA-sponsored online course um, that goes through each of the levels of exams. And it's actually really um, helpful. Um, you actually do get one-on-one -on -one instructor time with um, the video courses um, via email and video conferencing. Yeah. Um, and they'll help you with all of the radio theory as well. Would be. Any questions? Any call signs? BK3IV1? BK3GNU. GNU. GNU is not Unix. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. What does that translate to? That's a full call is an advanced license. So, yeah, DC to daylight, 400 watts. Yeah. Okay.